Good evening. It's a privilege to be able to bring God's Word before us from Psalm 19, verses 1 through 6. Psalm 19 is a wonderfully rich psalm. It is my favorite psalm, as you might have guessed, as I'm just jumping in and picking one out. You could easily spend three sermons in Psalm 19, and in fact, that is the plan. This morning, we'll be focusing on the first section, verses 1 through 6, where David speaks of God's revelation in creation, generally as our personal creator. This is God's word to us. It is his holy word. It is inspired and effective to bring life to those the Spirit gives it to you. So now listen to the word of God from Psalm 19, verses 1 through 6. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. Would you pray with me? Holy Father, we ask that you would work now in our hearts by your Spirit to uh, illuminate our minds, to uh, soften our hearts, uh, that we would not only be hearers of your word this morning, uh, but also uh, doers of it, having our worship enlarged by it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Many of us have felt the same impact that David speaks of here in Psalm 19. It's the impact of general or natural revelation made on man, the image of God. This impact is captured well by Richard Ramsey in his apologetics book, The Certainty of the Fate. He tells the story of how in his very first semester of college, uh, he enrolled in a history of philosophy class. And the very first question his professor asks him in the class is, how many of you believe in God? About half the class raises their hand, and no doubt, uh, there's a few people just too hesitant to make themselves targets. And the professor followed this up by saying, I hope that by the end of the semester, all of you will see there is no reason to believe in God. And so the semester went as every lecture and every day was devoted to deconstructing the student's confidence in the existence of God. Well, Ramsey struggled greatly through the class as he was met at 18 with a professor who year in and year out honed his craft and he started taking long walks with an increasingly full notebook of class notes and just pondering and wrestling with whether God indeed existed. Well, one night on one of his walks, he decided to lie down on the grass and look at the stars. He says, there were thousands of them sparkling like diamonds, and I sensed the endlessness of the universe as well as my smallness. Suddenly, I knew God was there. He felt as if his quickly derailing train had just been pushed back onto the tracks and was running smoothly once more. He says, I walked home that night with a sense of joy and peace that I had never felt before. Not only did I know God was there, I knew God. Well, what happened to Richard Ramsey? Was it a new philosophical argument? No. Certainly, Ramsey would go on to study theology and get masters and PhD and write books with many complicated arguments in them. But what really 
happened. I believe he had the same experience that King David tells us about this evening in Psalm 19. Something David experiences, something I have experienced, and something I know many of you probably have as well. The glory and majesty of God is communicated to us in a deep sense because we are all made in the image of God. God reveals to us, and we need to see two things this morning. First, God reveals to us in verses 1 through 4, the message of creation, and in verses 5 and 6, the joy of created purpose. So first, look in verses 1 through 4 there, the message of creation. These verses reveal four characteristics of the message of creation. It's content in verse 1, it's constancy in verse 2, it's manner in verse 3, that's when I ran out of C words, and it's scope. It's content, constancy, manner, and scope. Look with me at verse 1. What is the content of this declaration? Verse 1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. The heavens are speaking to us. Creation speaks of the glory of God, both his majestic attributes and his glorious handiwork. By the heavens, David means from his vantage point, the heavens with a parallel of the sky above, the the sun, the moon, the stars, the great expanse of space, all the vastness and greatness of God's created cosmos. He says it speaks to us about God and his glory. This declaring is like a great piece of artwork, and it's clothed in the white cloth, and there's the big moment when the cloth is ripped away and the crowd gasps. It's breathtaking. It's glorious. But the art makes us ask the question, who is the artist? How much more glorious is the one who made it? How much genius and creativity does it take to give us the heavens on a clear winter night? We say or even sing the word glory all the time. It's one of those words whose definition you're tempted to use to define it. Glory is just glory. Or maybe majestic. Well, more concretely, the Hebrew word is heaviness, weightiness. It has matter to it. It's important. There's honor and majesty. It's the sense of overwhelming awe that you feel when you look at the night sky. It's the heavens constantly reminding us that we are small and God is big. That is the feeling of the weight of glory. Glory says that God is central. Glory says that all of life should be organized around him. All of life should orbit around God and not us. Paul in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, defines the heaven's message this way. He says, God's invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. God is sovereign in power. He is the sovereign creator. I want you to think about all the power and energy potential contained in the entire universe. It's mind-boggling. It's incalculable. And God is the sovereign power behind this. He's upholding it. He's sustaining it all of the time. And yet, it has no draining impact on his strength to sustain it. God is not one extra kitchen appliance away from tripping a breaker switch. But God is not just power. He's not just might. 
Paul in Romans 1 is only arguing that we clearly see the utter transcendence of God's power in creation. But David also says creation is God's handiwork. What's handiwork? The sky is proclaiming the handiwork of God. Handiwork is craftsman language. God in scripture is frequently alluded to as a master craftsman. The Holy Spirit equips the craftsmen who make the tabernacle. So every time the sun rises, the earth is like the artwork. It's a well-lit painting in a museum. So God speaks his powerful creating word, let there be, do it again to the sun, and it just is. Colossians 1 says that all things were made by, through, and for Jesus. The Father is the grand creative architect. Christ is the builder, and the the Holy Spirit breathes life into all of creation. It's the grand handiwork of our glorious creating triune God. That is the message of creation. So I ask you, do you have active areas? Do you have areas in your life where you allow the majesty and glory of God to be pressed deeply into your heart? Do you, like David, take the time to pause, to meditate on and and pray about and praise God? I would encourage you to take the time to do this. It will stir up your soul to praise, to, to take the time to reflect on these things. So ask God by his spirit to work in you in awe of his craftsmanship. And we do this different ways. Some people do it by, by hiking, others by, by reading textbooks about the, the human eye or, or looking at honeybirds, at hummingbirds. But allow the time for the sheer wonder of it to be pressed on your heart. Look with me at verse 2. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. To understand the second aspect of natural revelation, we need to think about little kids. Kids can be persistent. If a child says something to you in the grocery store, they're going to repeat it again and again. Mom, 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 look at this, look at this, look at this. Can we get this? And they will not stop until you acknowledge them and repeat it back to them as Anna has been reminding me repeatedly over the last few weeks is, James, acknowledge her. She's going to keep going. So there's a constancy to the chatter. And this is what David says creation is doing to you. Creation is constantly speaking around us knowledge. Every sunrise, every sunset, every moment of every day and night, creation is speaking of the glory of God. And just like that kid in the grocery store, it will speak to you until you acknowledge it. So creation is always speaking But are you listening? So we need to take time to reflect and to listen and turn that back into praise for God, consciously acknowledging his creation, allowing the goodness and the majesty to be heard. So when you read your Bible in the morning and the weather is nice, just read it outside. Enjoy the beauty that is the tapestry of creation. I encourage one another in the way that you speak, What a wonderful morning the Lord has made that he has given us. What a beautiful sunset. Thank you, Lord. It's an opportunity to pray to you about this. Wow, Lord, that waterfall is loud and powerful, and I feel my smallness near it. How truly awesome is your strength, because you made it. So creation has content to his message. It's constant, but it also speaks in a certain way manner. General revelation has its limitations. So look with me in verse 3. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Now this is one of the harder phrases in this psalm, but the idea is to clarify the manner of this revelation, the how. There is no audible speech, no human 
language, but it accomplishes what it's supposed to do. It's not real human's language. It's general. There is no John 3.16 of general revelation. The stars, the mountains, the design of the bumblebee, the way the humming word bird flies does not tell us what scripture tells us that God so loved the world that he gave us his only begotten son. Creation does not tell us that, that Jesus died as a propitiatory sacrifice on our behalf, that he is our advocate, that he is the God man. So everything script, creation says is clear, but it's less specific. It's non-redemptive. Remember Romans 1. It's specifically the divine power and glory of God displayed. And just as you can tell a lot about an artist from his paintings, you still must read their biography to really get to know them. This may cause controversy, but when I'm at an art museum, I always look for that little plaque with the artist's name, a little about them, and I really focus in on reading the, those things. It's, it's interesting what's communicated them. Why did they write this piece? What year was it? Uh, where did they do this? However, you would never go to a museum just to read the little descriptions. If you took away all the paintings and left those little plaques, it, would be, uh, it wouldn't be a museum. So we need both of these things. So praise God that he gives us both the painting and his written revelation, which is so much more than a little plaque in a museum. Well, this brings us to our fourth attribute in verse 4a. Here we see the scope of creational revelation. Their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. There is a universal extent to the message of creation. All people, all people everywhere have had clearly communicated to them that there is a God, that he is glorious, and is creator. Now the message is clear, but in the sinfulness of our hearts, all people everywhere suppress distort, find ways around this knowledge. There is universal knowledge of God, but there is also universal idolatry. All people everywhere are held accountable and responsible for their rejection of this message. From the very beginning, Adam quickly received special revelation, and since the fall, the limits of general revelation are even more severe due to sin. So we need the special redemptive revelation of God. We need the proclamation of the gospel. And that's the particular calling of ministers, of Christian teachers, of mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters in Christ, of siblings to each other, to your neighbor. We owe them all the proclamation of the gospel because that is what brings life. And only that alone can bring life. You cannot just look at creation and come to a true understanding of religion that is pleasing to God. You will construct an idol. Because sin has blinded our minds and allows us to misinterpret general revelation, distort its meaning, and pridefully limit ourselves to it. General revelation's value is seeing the power and divinity of God, oppressing that into our hearts of seeing that we have sinned and we have fallen short of justice. But we still need this scripture, this written word to us to clearly see our sin, our need for the work of Christ, for the cross and our salvation, of how God desires to be worshipped, how he desires us to live. And that's why this is not the whole psalm. The psalm continues to answer this need. David sees this need. Richard Ramsey's testimony of the power of seeing the stars is assuring him of the power and presence of God. And this did not happen in a vacuum in his life. Why did he walk away converted or granted this newfound assurance? Well, we just said general revelation cannot get the job done. Well, what's the explanation? 
Well, he helpfully relays that to us. He had been told throughout his life the gospel. He knew who Jesus was. And it was the Holy Spirit seizing the means of the tapestry of the stars to drive this truth home to his heart, to drive home the truths that he had heard from childhood, the scriptures which made him wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. You do not know when God and his sovereign timing will bring salvation or renewed assurance. This gives us great hope. He is faithful. The Spirit does this. So brothers and sisters, be encouraged to share the gospel, to share the knowledge of Christ to others, to pray for children who have gone astray and aren't even uh, heeding you, aren't, aren't listening anymore, have shut their ears to what you said. If we have faithfully told and proclaimed it to them, God, by his spirit, can always reach hearts. We do not know when the spirit acts. So we pray for those who wander. This brings us to our second point. The joy of created purpose. Verses 4 through 6, much more briefly. David doesn't just give us a theology of general revelation. He gives us the poetry of it. We know that creation is glorifying God. All of it is. But David gives us a specific example. He picks something big and ever-present, the sun. How does the sun do its work as a creature? How does it do its work to proclaim God? Well, helpfully, David reminds us that the sun is a creature. It's not to be worshipped. He doesn't use language like Mother Earth. He doesn't drift into deifying creation. No, he uses metaphors. The, the sun is like something. What is the sun like? Look in verses 4 through 6. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens and its circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. David is giving us a powerful image of the sun rejoicing, rejoicing to do what it was designed to do. The sun is rejoicing to do what it was designed to do. Creation is not meaninglessness. It has a task, a mission, a purpose. Even the most powerful element of our solar system that readily comes to mind, the sun gives us some of the greatest blessings, and the sun is just excited to over and over and over again continue to do the will of God, to delightfully bring glory to God, to simply bless the rest of creation with the message of God's glory day in and day out. Creation from the least to the greatest delights in its purpose. So wait a minute. Why is this so spectacular? Why is it life-changing and even provocative for David to be talking about creation in this way? To be talking about creation delighting to serve its creator? Well, what if David is wrong? What if David is absolutely incorrect? What if creation really isn't delighting to serve its creator? What if there is no speech, no meaning? Well, we would call that secular, materialistic humanism. David recognizes the meaning, the purposefulness of the world, where our God and Father is the majestic, personal, infinite, thinking, knowing, relational God. The world has meaning. So let's first look at this meaning, and then we'll look at the alternative to it. The sun is running its course with joy. It's a bridegroom happily married. 
Had a good family night. It's leaving the house with a hug and a kiss in the morning. The son is a strong man running his race, fully prepared, full of energy, ready to set a new record, fully warmed up, ready to win the prize. It has a task. There is a joy to purpose of being fully equipped to do your job, of working on behalf of such a great creator, accomplishing exactly what you were meant to do, accomplishing what you were looking forward to. Think of the difference it makes getting out of bed when you have something important to do, an important breakfast, a a meeting, a, a race that morning, versus getting out of bed when you have nothing to do. It's much harder to get out of that bed without the purpose. Now let's flip the script. What are the images of the naturalistic, materialist world, the world where matter is all there is? It's the language of chance, of just time for the sake of time, of randomness, and ultimately purposelessness. There's a crippling effect to not knowing your purpose. There's anxious toil only reacting to immediate events around you when you have no grand overarching meaning. Dr. James Anderson, his review of The Atheist's Guide to Reality by Alex Rosenberg, uh, The Committed Atheist, shows how Rosenberg actually gets to the heart of the difference between the value and purpose that living in God's creation holds versus the cold, valueless, and and emptiness that comes from godless vacuum. His goal is to get people to start acting consistently with their worldview. This is Rosenberg's atheistic goal, not Anderson. So Rosenberg has a goal of getting atheists to act consistently. So he essentially answers a series of questions to show what happens if we consistently ignore the image of God in us, if we suppress it. So he states, is there a God? No. What is the purpose of the universe? There is none. What is the meaning of life? Ditto. Why am I here? Just dumb luck. Is there a soul? Is it immortal? Are you kidding? What happens when we die? Everything pretty much goes on as before, except us. What is the difference between right and wrong, good and bad? There is no moral difference between them. Does history have any meaning or purpose? It's full of sound and fury, but signifies nothing. So Rosenberg is quite clear. It's a bleak, purposeless, meaningless picture. It's a picture of someone who is consistently living where the message of the glory of God has been suppressed and systematically exterminated from every area of life. We are back in Romans 1, verses 18 to 22. If you want to flip there, Paul says in Romans 1, verses 18 through 22, these words to us. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, has been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinkings and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. It's a bleak picture painted by Paul of a heart hardened against God's reveal, God revealing himself in creation. And this is what life consistently suppressing this comes to. Well, thankfully, 
most of our neighbors, friends, and co-workers are not nearly as self-consistent as Rosenberg. If you see anyone lose a cat or a dog and the, the armor quickly cracks, there's a real bridge here to offer our neighbors the purpose and meaning they know can only be fulfilled by a personal God. But we cannot forget the limits of natural or general revelation. It has limits. So we are fallen. So too many times we and our neighbors are tempted to go off into general spirituality and search for transcendence and make up God in our own image. If we substitute general revelation for special revelation, we'll fall into this idolatry. But there are very few self-consistent, hard atheists, but many spiritual people. But that is cheating. To have the joy of created purpose, we must honor and be in relationship with our creator and king. To have a foundation of this joy, we must have a father seated in heaven. We must have Christ Jesus revealing him to us. This is the hope for every Christian. And you have a touch point with everyone you encounter made in the image of God. Everyone is looking for meaning. Everyone desires a compelling message, but people cheat, creating facades of meaning and purpose. So we must draw people's eyes to the joy, to the hope, to the true meaning that comes from a personal sovereign God, and that will only be found in Christ Jesus if it's not to be an idol. It's an infectious, tireless warmth that comes from this sun running its course. It's a warmth that comes from being a part of something bigger than just serving yourself and being curved in on yourself. So as you read Psalm 19, remember this. You have experienced sunrises, beautiful sunsets. You have probably hiked to the top of a mountain along a ridge line and looked across valleys. Just by being human, you have felt the yearning for transcendence. You know God's creation, and you know you have a creator. You have a soul and a purpose. You know Rosenberg's answers of meaningless were wrong. It struck you deep in your heart that this is not the way the world is. You have a soul and a purpose and a creator. And you owe your love and allegiance to him because he is glorious. And if you know him, you know he has blessed you in many ways. But we must go one step further because we also know things are not how they should be. There is a fallenness to creation. There is a corruption to it. We have earthquakes and pandemics, mosquitoes and poison ivy. We kill, murder, make war, lie. And it's not just nature being nature or the people out there. No, it's here in our hearts. And we need the Bible to tell us more, to excavate that. We need God speaking to us personally and his word to tell us about that. So while creation does not use actual words, thankfully God does. God made us in his image, and he speaks to us through more than just creation. He has revealed himself in the Bible, the record of the many things he has said and done in history, written for us in his book. And we'll look more closely at the perfections of this book as we are brought deeper into Psalm 19 by David the next time we look at this psalm. Until then, meditate on verses 1 through 6. Be doers of it. Put it into practice and prayer and praise in your life and make it the meditation of your heart in the coming days. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the joy 
of living in this world before your face. Father, we ask that you would press these truths deeply on our hearts, that you would show us that to live as your sons and daughters is to live joyfully. Father, we ask that uh, you would be with us in this coming week to see your creation afresh, to have listening uh, ears, and that we would not too quickly um, pass by the, the blessings of what you show us in it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.